Well, we've got 15 minutes. I think we should take a little look at uh, the book of Romans. And uh, we'll pick up where we left off in the seventh chapter and the seventh verse of Romans. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. First of all, I think this is a rhetorical question. The law obviously is not sin. The law is given by God. God does not give sin. Um, I would not have known sin except through the law. Now, I think, I know, I'm confident that Paul has this expectation that his readers are using a little bit of common sense. I mean, the first time the word sin appears in the Bible is Genesis 4-7, where, where God is speaking to Cain, and he says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is waiting at, its, at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. The law hadn't been given. We don't have any suggestion here that God had walked Cain through what sin was. I think we have some intuitive understanding that there are some things that are just fundamentally wrong. Every culture has laws against murder and against adultery and against, um, you know, theft and there are certain things that are just fundamentally wrong but but what Paul is saying is that I would not have been aware of how sinful I am had God not spelled out some things and he uses I like the example he uses I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet and the reason I like this one is because it's so natural for us to look at what the neighbor has and says yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, whatever it is. Well, I, I, well, I wish I had a. I wish I had a. Wish I had an 80 horsepower tractor. Yeah, I wish I had a Corvette. Yeah, I wish my wife was that young or could cook like that. Yeah, I wish I had 100 acres and not just two acres. Whatever it is, that is so natural that we would not have understood what an issue that is if God had said, "Thou shalt not covet." And, and it's not that God has just arbitrarily taken a bunch of things and said, just arbitrarily for no reason. God understood, God understands that it's not good for us to covet and that it compromises the attention that we're going to pay to spiritual things and the obedience we're going to have to spiritual things if what we're focused on is earthly things and I'm going to have to work harder and do more overtime and whatever it takes so that I can have a Corvette like my neighbor has or I can have a tractor like my neighbor has or, or whatever it is. But the law itself we know is good and we know that, that God was just simply um, codifying do's and don'ts for us so we would have a better understanding of what righteous living looks like and what holy look, living looks like and what God's expectations of us are but what the law also did is it made us very aware very painfully aware of how fall we sh how short we fall of that standard is the law sin certainly not on the contrary I would not have known sin so what Paul is saying it's a good thing for me to know what my sin is how can I can confess it how can I be grateful to God for what Christ did on the cross if I don't really understand how sinful I am? I would not have known covetous unless the law said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Now he's not saying that I wasn't sinning. He's not saying that at all. But he's saying that, that as, a, as a body of law, as a body of commandments, I wasn't guilty of those 
that I didn't know about. Um, Jesus says it like this. I'm going to turn to Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus says, this is 1247, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. It's kind of like, kind of like children. Now, I don't have children, but I've been one, and I remember very clearly, you know, the first time I got caught doing something I wasn't supposed to, I got a little lecture, and I also got it, if I catch you doing this again, I'm going to paddle your bottom. If I did it again, there was no question about what was going to happen. I knew better. And, and I, think about, I think about Jesus in the 15th chapter of John. He's talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the elders of the church. And he said, had I not come and, and said to the, them the things that I said, they would be without sin. Now, he doesn't mean they would have committed no sins, but what he means is they really thought, they really believed that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They really thought they were supposed to be wearing purple clothes and standing on the corners and giving these great speeches, and they really thought they were supposed to be letter of the law and the law of Moses. And as long as they did that, it was okay for them to... But Jesus told them over in Matthew 23, 23, he says, these things... I'm going to read it so I get it right. In uh, Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. You've, done the, you've observed the letter of the law, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. They weren't thinking about why they were doing it. You know, what the reason was their requirement to do it. It was all about, it was mechanical. Just, oh, every year we've got to sacrifice this bull, we've got to take this ram. They never gave, they never gave it much thought or prayer or whatever the reason you were doing it. <coughs> and, and they wanted it to be about the letter of the law and we still do that we try to say okay if I do this and I do this and do this oh, I'm good Jesus, and then I can good to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm good to go you know uh, and and and, and uh, one of the very first things God called me to do um, in ministry was as a young adults minister and and young adults and new Christians in general kind of have this attitude that okay it's a sin Okay, it's a sin for me to commit adultery, right? Obviously, it's not a sin for Jesus to sit at the well with the woman, the Samaritan woman, and talk to her about spiritual things. So somewhere, somewhere on this line, it becomes, somewhere it becomes a sin. And they'll say, well, what about if I just look at her legs? Okay, you know, well, what about if I just, you know, what about if I just do this? And my attitude, my answer is, if you're asking the question, you're already sinning because you're already trying to figure out how to get around. The fact is, if you know this is a sin and you know this isn't, you want to be as far down this spectrum, you know, and because and, and then it, what that leads to is, well, I know being drunk is a sin, and I know Jesus turned water into wine, so how much wine can I drink before it, you know? If you're asking the question, what you're, what you're really wanting to know is, how much sin can I get away with? The answer is, you need to be led by the Spirit. And if the Spirit says a glass of wine is okay, then a glass of wine is okay. The Bible says very, 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 very clearly, be sober. Mm -hmm. Be sober. And you know when you're not sober. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says to be sober because your adversary, the lion, your, your adversary prowls about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. I said, can anybody in here, and, and, and it's funny because he'll say, yeah, I can drink, I can drink three six packs, I can still drive just fine. I'll say, okay, oh, everybody in here be completely, completely honest. It's a hot summer day, you haven't had lunch yet, your stomach's empty, you gulp down a beer. Is there anybody in here who can tell me, who can honestly tell me that that doesn't, just a little teeny tiny bit, change 
the things that you might be willing to say or the things that you might be willing to do. And everybody's like, well, okay, you got me there. Sober is sober. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a continuum, and at some point, you know, from 1 to 100, and once we hit 46, it becomes a sin. If we're trying to figure out what we can get away with, we already got a problem. We already have a problem. So that's why he can say, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Once I saw the law, once God said, don't, 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 do, 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 and I looked at that and compared that with my life, I realized I was a transgressor, and the, and the, and the wages of sin is death. Verse 10, and the commandment, which was to bring life. I mean, the hope that God was saying, if you'll just do these things, if you just do these things, I'll accept you, and you can look forward to eternal life. Except nobody could do those things. The commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. It is God's way of saying, here's where the bar is, here's the standard, here's, here's how I want everyone to live. And we all look at that, and if we're honest, we realize that we just simply can't. We're just simply not capable of it. We might be technically capable of it, but we're not. We're not going to. We never have. We never will. And Jesus died on the cross to close that gap, to reconcile us where our sin had unreconciled us from God. And, uh, and I've been reading the... I, I've been re I just, just recently finished reading the book of Psalms again, and I'm just struck over and over again how many times David says, your judgment of me, your, your condemnation of me, your punishment of me, your chastisement of me only underscores how, how righteous you are. Your righteousness is revealed in your judgments because you've set the standard here and your, pol and your policy for deviation from that is a zero tolerance policy. Your judgments, your commandments, your statutes all demonstrate and underscore just how holy and how righteous and how good you are. And when you chasten me, when you chasten me, thank you, thank you, Lord, when you chasten me, first of all, it's because you love me. Second of all, it's because I'm doing something that's not in my best interest. And thirdly, you are a holy God who can have no partnership who can who cannot encourage who cannot condone who cannot have fellowship with any sin at all and so your judgments are righteous and good and your law is holy and just and good and when we and when the spirit and when we are grieved when we are sorrowful because of our sin we are acknowledging how good God's law is and whether it's and whether it's the law of Moses for we know from, from 1 Timothy 1.8, Paul tells Timothy, he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. If you keep it because you just don't want to sin, that's a wonderful thing. If you're keeping it because you think that observing the letter of the law is how I get into heaven, we got a problem. But the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. But as Jesus said, you should be keeping the law, but, but you should be doing those things God really wants. You should be merciful and just and you should be led by the Spirit has then what is good become death to me certainly not but sin okay law is not the problem sin is the problem sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good the law said do this don't do this any deviation from that is sin. The law is good, but it made me aware of sin. Sin, that it might appear sin, that it might be clear and obvious that it's contrary to God's will for my life, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. It was already sin, but once God said, you shall not, 
and I continued doing it, it was all, all the more sinful, all the, all the, all the more problematic. The, the, we cannot pay for any sin, the tiniest sin we cannot pay for. The price was paid on the cross by the Lord Jesus Christ, but if we go on willfully sinning, saying, oh God, Jesus covered it, Jesus got covered it. If we go on willfully sinning, if our attitude is, ah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, good, I can keep on doing whatever I want to. Paul has already told us three times now that we are not to take advantage of. We are not to go on sinning. To the contrary, now that we know what that price was and now that we've been reconciled, if in fact we have the Spirit in us, we are not going to continue living in sin. We're going to sin, but we're not going to continue living in sin. We're not going to continue willfully sinning. And if we do, that is, I'm going to argue that's proof positive that we've not been born again. Now, all is not lost. We can still get born again. I, I mean, my attitude for 30 years was I'd been baptized. I could do what I wanted to. God had to forgive me because I got baptized. Fortunately, I lived long enough to learn better and to truly repent and to be filled with the Spirit and be saved.